Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Kalpani. I'm the director of the Alakana Institute. Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we are here to celebrate the life and legacy uh, and the works of two great Pan Africanists, but not just them, but all the folks that have been striving and struggling for Pan Africanism for the last uh, over a decade now, over a century now. Um, we are here to celebrate the Garvey and Kuruma Lecture Series. This is our uh, 11th annual. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we hear, we're glad that you all can join us online, those of you who are with us online, uh, those who are here in the audience. Uh, we're uh, celebrating uh, this, the, the legacy that these folks have set up for us, right? Think about Marcus Garvey and Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, really the first uh, Pan-African conference, I uh, was doing some reading on this before, and I, I wrote a, uh, the W.B. Du Bois, uh, in the inside of video, W.B. Du Bois, I wrote, I wrote the uh, intro to, or the section on Pan-Africanism. And in there I talk about how Henry Sylvester Williams from Trinidad and Tobago was the first person who began the, uh, uh, the, the Pan-African conference. All of the ideas about Pan-Africanism started even before then. Uh, the ideas about bringing Africa together. Uh, not only, with, only by Africans, but also by Europeans. They had this idea, if you go back and look at Cecil Rhodes. Uh, unfortunately, Cecil Rhodes, if you look up at him on, on Wikipedia, he has one foot on Cairo and one foot on Cape. Uh, so uh, that this idea about the, 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 the wealth of Africa has been obviously known for many years, uh, for, for centuries. And so we here uh, are honoring uh, the folks who came before us by continuing the legacy on uh, what we understand, what we need to know about uh, Pan-Africanism. Uh, our first lecture was by Zizwe uh, uh, Poe, who was a professor at uh, Lincoln University in, in Pennsylvania. And he came and did a lecture on Nkrumah. He, he's an Nkrumah expert, and he wrote a book on Nkrumah. And I definitely sparked the idea about starting this lecture. So his lecture, even though it wasn't named the Garvey and Kuma Lecture Series, uh, that was the first time we ever you, you began to start thinking about it and developing the, 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 this conference, this, this workshop series on Pan Africanism. In addition to that, we had uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, uh, we had the uh, brother of Sankara, Thomas Sankara, who was the former president of uh, Burkina Faso. His brother is Paul Sankara came at, at one of our lectures. We had uh, Mayor Raj Baraga, who was here in 2019. We had a hiatus uh, after 2019 because there was obviously the pandemic, everything got shut down. We didn't have any uh, uh, conferences or workshops. Uh, but now that we're back at it, uh, we're, we're here, we're doing a strong. Uh, the other thing we had, uh, we, well, the person we had uh, was uh, one other person I wanted to mention. Um, uh, the president, she's actually a presidential candidate now for Liberia. Uh, and so, uh, uh, Magdalena Tumper. So, if you look her up, she's the current uh, one, of the, one of, I think there's, there's 19 men here running against her, and she's the only woman running for president in Liberia right now. So, uh, so but we're honored to have her here and, and have that relationship. So we'll have her back next time as president. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for, at least. Uh, so if, if those, those kinds of relationships are things that we've built. Uh, this is the end of our African History Month program. And so here, what I want to do at this point is that I want to just uh, remind you that if you can make sure your cell phones are off, uh, we would appreciate that if they're not. Uh, but you can also, uh, if you want, we're going to uh, uh, send out or post or something, the link for uh, sharing this information. If you have friends you want to share it with, uh, let me know and I'll make sure that we get the information to you and share it with on social media right now. Uh, the last thing I want to do is I want to take a moment, uh, and, and, and uh, I've got to bring my plant today, but the, the, the floor is all right. We're going to do a little bit of libations real quick. We've got to we'll do an abbreviated libations because we want to get started. So, uh, we pour libations because we are paying tribute to those that came before us. And that we want to uh, recognize that, that the essence of what we do is empowered, is imbued by uh, other folks around us. And if we, as long as we understand uh, those kinds of things, then we have the ability 
to uh, uh, be sure that we're, we're, that we're, we're paying tribute to the fact that before us there was so much uh, that folks had to offer and we can continue to offer great things to people if we understand that we didn't get here by ourselves, that we have to pay tribute to those who came before us. So as we do so, we pour libations, uh, and then we actually say our shame with us, you know, you can do that. Uh, so we pour libations for those ancestors who came from the beginning to the beginning, we say our shame. Uh, for those who made it possible for us to understand writing language and uh, all the kinds of knowledge systems that we have, we say our shame. Okay. Uh, whether they're from ancient Kemet or from the, the southern part of Africa and Assam or elsewhere, uh, no matter where they came from, they gave us the ability to understand the realities of the world around us. Uh, we pour libations for those who struggle uh, in the face of opposition, whether on the continent or in the process of middle passage. And those who came thousands of years before, and there was more and more evidence about African people being in the Americas. Most recent uh, archaeological dig in uh, Brazil shows that there was some African, African remains from eight to 9,000 years old in Brazil. Uh, so for those who came before, and then there's a book called They Came Before Columbus, and there's several other books that talk about the experience of Africans in the diaspora long before. So for them, we say, I should. Um, we have uh, the folks who came across the Middle Passage. Uh, some didn't make it. Uh, some died before they got on board these slave ships. Some died when they got into the slave ships. And some uh, died shortly after getting on the other side. So for them, we say, Ashe. Uh, for the ones who, who made it to the other side and created inventions, I'm now one of the uh, board members of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame. So there's a whole cast of folks who created things uh, and made it possible for uh, everybody around the world. The stoplight happens because somebody invented it, uh, whose name was Garrett A. Morgan. The gas mask was invented by Garrett A. Morgan. These simple things created the space for us to, to change the world around us. That's it. And so uh, I asked you to call up the names of your own ancestors. You can call them up now. Uh, Nancy Franks. Call your own ancestors up. That's it. Come on. That's uh, it. That's it. Uh, we call the names of uh, those that are right here and locally. Uh, Amir Baraka, who is one of the uh, stalwarts right here. I should. Uh, we call the name of uh, Malcolm X. It was, it was his, they reflected on his uh, assassination a couple of days ago. I should. Uh, and so many other folks who made it possible for us to be here. Uh, we we, we all up there with them. We all up there the essence of who they were, and we recognize that their their sacrifices. Their, their successes and their striving are the reasons that we're here today. Ashe? 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 All right. Uh, so the last thing I want to do is, uh, I don't know who the eldest person in the room it might be, uh, Professor Small, but uh, we want to uh, ask the permission of my elders to begin the process. Thank you, buddy. Uh, so we, that's the other part we do, and we, we want to make sure that as we're, we're, we're moving forward into our formal thing, that we, we recognize that the elders are home. He said, no, I pack myself up and go. <laughs> but thankfully, he's uh, given us permission to do so. Today, I want to take this time to introduce uh, Professor James Small. Uh, Professor Small is uh, a, a giant in the world of uh, uh, black studies, African studies. He worked at City College, I believe, 17 years, 18 years. Uh, under the leadership of Dr. Leonard Jevons. Uh, he, uh, they together uh, purchased the Sana Lodge in a hotel in Ghana. So they have, uh, they've been working to establish African, African diaspora presence back on the continent for many years now. Uh, he is a well-known lecturer uh, globally. He's leaving here in fact today and going to give a lecture in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so the, 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 his what he brings to the table in understanding African history and culture, uh, understanding as a uh, Baba Marista, uh, understanding African spirituality, uh, helping folks to to navigate the spaces that we're in, and understand how who we are as African people and how to navigate the, the terrain that we, we find ourselves in. And so we, that's what those, some of the things we want to do to uplift ourselves. And we need our elders, our our, our, our well learned folks to share with us the wisdoms and knowledge that they've uh, amassed over the years so that they then can, and too, share with us uh, uh, how, as we move forward, the, the way 
ways to uplift and transform the world around us. So uh, without further ado, I want to bring to the podium uh, Professor James Small. Bye. <laughs>
Messiah Martin Gotti said, I came to America to implement the Tuskegee model. So why are we constantly positing Gotti up against Booker Washington? Ignorance of the history. If you go to the Schomburg Library, you will find one of the largest collections of letters between Mr. Gotti and anyone in America. Those letters between Mr. Gotti and Booker Teleferry of Washington. Mr. Washington invited Garvey to come over here and work with him. But Booker was assassinated before we got here. But no one told you that Booker Washington was assassinated. Have you ever heard that? And they didn't tell you he was assassinated? Do you know who Booker T. Washington was? Raise your hands. You want to know Booker T. Washington? Oh, we all got to work with you. You got to find out who was Booker Teleferry of Washington. And then you got to study a conference he did before Padmore and before the boys moved to make a Pan African conference in Europe. Booker had a conference at Tuskegee, um, a conference with people of the colored world, they called it the conference of the Negro world. People came from Malawi, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Jamaica. Um, Brazil and other countries to Tuskegee to attend this conference. Uh, no one called it a Pan African conference. It was as Pan African as any other conference ever held in the world. Because someone in telling your historical story wanted to leave Booker Washington out of it. And that's impossible if you're going to tell the story of the African American. It's absolutely impossible. <laughs> to discuss pan Africanism without discussing Booker T. Washington as one of the great pan Africanists. But he wasn't a Marxist. And unfortunately, in the 50s and the 60s, the African-American radical story was being written about and articulated primarily by Marxists, trained by the white left, and not by those who came and grew up out of the African-American community. And so you need to study some history and get the fashion that it came since you want to really get the language right. If you don't get the language right, you will tell a story, it just won't be your story. It will be someone else's story. And so you want to understand that there was a guy named Frederick Douglass who influenced Lincoln <coughs> to never kick him in the pants to get the emancipation pass, and then fought with them get blacks to fight in the war where close to a million African Americans fought in that war. They give our numbers as being 200,000 plus. We lost about 40,000 in the Civil War. But they weren't counting the half a million plus behind the lines to escape from the plantation and were doing the work for the Union Army. They were the carpenters, they were the brick masons, they were driving the wagon, they were raising the house, they were going to food, they were the nurses, etc. That made up the army as well. So more than a half a million African Americans freed themselves from slavery in a war that's called the Civil War. Okay. You need to understand this because you need to understand the role this man, Fred Douglas, played in all of this in tutoring John Brown. And when he saw that Harper's Ferry was going to fail, he met the Brown the week before and begged him not to go ahead. The Brown system doing it anyway. They got caught and they got lynched and they lost most of the troops. But you probably don't know the story about Harper's Ferry time, do you? When Mr. John Brown of the California, you have to bring me to a couple of lessons. Yeah, well, this is, this is an intro sociology class, so it's a, okay. it's a little different. But yeah, we need to Yeah, but that together. sociology, that, that's the thing that's going on back. Y'all don't go ahead and drop people crazier than they are. Unless we change the language. But the history of the African American is an extraordinary history because it's not disconnected. And Pan Africanism, the definition of Pan Africanism is really the deliberate effort for the unification of African people wherever they are in the world. Pan simply means to unite. And to unite Africans in the diaspora and on the continent. But all about diversity 
and one political, economic, and cultural order. We have achieved it, but that's what we're fighting for. And in that fight, we were able to dislodge colonialism on the continent of Africa. Starting with the Sudan, we like to say God, but God didn't come independent until a year after the Sudan. The Sudan is still in Africa, whether they speak Arabic or a Muslim. They're still in Africa. It is an African nation. They're the first African nation to free themselves from colonialism at that time period. Then followed by God, which is an English-speaking Christian nation. So we tend to lean there, but our own fact is prejudice. And as though Christianity was somehow more um, genteel than Islam, both of them practiced genocide for hundreds of years against African people. Neither is worth much. If we can look at Nazism and Mendelism, the place it belongs, Christianity and Islam did worse than the African world, and Nazism never began to do as bad as that was. But if you don't know history, you won't even understand what I just said. And then you want to understand why the black world had mental issues about identity. And that basically it said true freedom, the only true freedom is to be shackled to your identity. That identity is African. No matter what the subsets are, Jamaican, Black American, Nigerian, Ghanaian, the title of our identity is African. Everything else is just an expression of aspects of the greater African identity. And when we talk about Pan-Africanism, we're talking about trying to create that greater African identity that will allow for the unification without losing the diversity. Because the diversity is as legitimate and as real as the greater body of African peoples. We're the largest people, ethnic or racial group on the planet. We're nearly three and a half, four billion people. Except people say our name on us. Instead of you're African and you speak Spanish, you're not really African. You're, you're colonized because language makes you race. That's the only place where they make language make the race, and they want to pay. The Spanish-speaking Africans out of the African race, then they said your language determined your race. And we fall for that darkness and try to live as though that's reality, looking in a mirror every moment. And we refuse him to deal with what you just looked at. And then we say in the hemisphere that the French-speaking Africans, they're not really Africans somehow. So in the United States, they say that you're 45 to 50 million people, but we didn't count 20% of you in the census. Like you've never counted us for me, ever. So given the 20% you didn't count, so now it's 60 to 70 million. Then give me my Spanish-speaking family back, now I'm about 100 million. Then give me my French-speaking family, now I'm about 110 million. Then give me my recent immigrants from Nigeria and Cameroon and Kenya, and now I'm about 140 million. I'm the largest ethnic population in North America. If we were to discuss pan Africanism the way it should be discussed, that is inclusive of all African people, whether they know their identities or not, because what we are fighting against is post slavery trauma syndrome post after slavery, a genocidal process that we went through for hundreds of years, and we got is trauma is the damage done to us psychologically, culturally, politically, and spiritually. And the syndrome is that damage continues. Except now we are the motive force that's continuing the very damage that the genociders were doing for hundreds of years. We're promoting, self-promoting our destruction. Basically, because of the ignorance of African history, African culture, and African spiritual concepts. If we talk about Pan-Africanism, 
we tell them, like, you in the case of African people are on fundamentals. How do you provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for yourself, your family, and your patients? No people survive unless they can guarantee that they can do that for themselves. To do that, you've got to get control of economic, politics, and culture where you live. And then get control of land, labor, and resources where you live. So the discussion of Pan-Africanism from the very beginning is about those items I just mentioned. How do we take Africa away from the colonizers and use the resources of Africa to make sure that African peoples can provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for themselves, and to be in control throughout the world, wherever the African has gone, of land, labor, and resources, and the demand of economic politics and culture. If you're not factoring those pieces, then you're not talking about pan africanism It's not an organization. It is a process of organizing people around the fundamentals of building a civilization. And so the men, like the great Marcus Garvey, who came to this country at the invitation of Booker T. Washington, but Booker had been assassinated. By the way, anybody know where Booker T. Washington died? He died on a train in Baltimore on the way back to ski because he had been poisoned in New York. And when he realized he wasn't going to get better, he didn't want to die there. So he sent his wife and his aide to come and get him and let him go home to his beloved to see to die, but he didn't make it home. This is a man who probably did more for American economically than the work he did with George Washington Cobb than Carnegie or Robert Cobb. But he was an African American, so we don't learn much about the way to Washington. And they said, oh, he set up a college to ski. It still exists. How many leaders gave us a university on the level of to ski? Anybody know one? Malcolm didn't do it. Martin didn't do it. Gary didn't do it. Do you know how many tens of thousands of scholars have graduated on the ski from the continent of Africa, from the United States, from the Caribbean, over these years? and the contribution that they're able to make to the African world? No. Because someone has not told you your real story. And your understanding of Pan-Africanism is narrow and limited. We simply talk about the unity of African people around things economic, political, and cultural. And the ability to provide for your people the fundamentals of food, clothing, shelter, safety and security. You can't do that in a visionized space. You must have some sort of communal, collective, cooperative, unifying effort for that to be successful. And that's why Africa today, with all of the independent there about 50 nations, we're not much better off than we were doing the long years. Because we have not united. We have an African Union, but it's Fundamentally, just a name. It's not a function. Because we should not even need a passport to go from one country to the other. And I'm happy to see these building the states from one country to the other so we can walk to where we want to go. We feel like it or by a bicycle. But we're still operating within the, the geological constructs of the colonizers. <coughs> We haven't been able to really break it because we don't know history. It's the only history with a race of mystery. There's nothing mysterious about white people in power. They murdered their way to power. They committed genocide across the world, killing almost a billion people just in the last five to six hundred years. They have the power that they have. You want to have power that way, then go get it. But that's the only going to be equal to that. Then they're going to kill a billion people in a few hundred years. Take their land and swallow and destroy their institutions. So stop dreaming in fantasy world. Getting a degree is not going to do that for you. Unifying as advocates will do that for you. 
You're the majority of the world population. You control 70% of the world wealth in your earth. Why are you bathing at the corner of a thief's building? We are allowed to call anyone who has committed genocide against any other people what they were, but those who committed genocide against us, we can't even analyze them properly if we are not allowed to label them with the crime that they committed against humanity. But the UN did have a meeting in Orisha and um, in, in, in South Africa, I think it was the Orisha Accords, but it declared the transatlantic slavery a crime against humanity. And that the people believe that they should be held legally accountable for that crime. And have been committed murder in so many millions of our people. But back to understanding Pan Africanism. The great man, like the Martin Delaney, who we are usually associate with Pan Africanism, who comes before Burr Washington, he was born in America, but his grandfather came from Nigeria, a place called Abiyo. Anybody in from Nigeria? Anybody know where Abiyo is? It is one of those states that is sacred by ancestral rituals and teachings. And so Martin Lane, before the US Civil War, travels back to Africa. He goes to Africa, to his grandfather's place, the Abiyaruta. And they organized an organization called the Niger Delta, the Niger Delta, the Niger Valley Association. And what was the purpose? To bring all the Africans in the United States back home to the continent of Africa. And it was supported by Crown Moments and other black leaders at the time, that they felt that only returning home and separating ourselves from the European could be developed as people. But when it came back to America, the Civil War was kicking off. And so they said, so maybe if we support this war, we can free our people. And you know, the lady would become the highest ranking black military officer in the American military. And like I said, more than half a million of us fought in that war, not the war. So that was our war of liberation. And more of us died percentage-wise than whites because there was no mercy shown for us when we were put in the war. We were just slaughtered. Whereas others would have been, you know, put in the prison camp. So if you know your history, you can erase the mystery and then you can really look at that what you said. It started the day we set up the first station. 1619, notwithstanding, let's go back to 1527, with the Spanish coming up from the Dominican Republic, what is today's Dominican Republic, to South Carolina. This is before 1619, almost 100 years. And about 400 Africans rebelled, burnt their ships, they got away back. And those Africans stayed here and amalgamated with the Africans who lived in Louisiana before them. And then, so Walter Raleigh, he left about 150 of us around North Carolina because they ran out of food and he was trying to make it back to England. And he said, I can't take all you black folks because y'all have to eat all the food. So they just left us there. This was before 1619. And so we amalgamated with the people we call Native Americans. The Asiatics and the blacks who were already here. If we study African history, we know that there were probably by then hundreds of thousands of Malians, many native people who had come to America over a thousand ships just a few centuries before. No one talked about that in history. Or you would have read the diary. Uh, Christopher Columbus, when he talked about the Ethiopians he met here. Or his brother, who talked about the Ethiopians who was his guy. Or Verrazano in New York, talking about the Ethiopians he met in New York. Ethiopians was the word of African in that day and time about the Europeans. As we were the Aborigine in all land, we were the Aborigine in this land, even before the Asiacs, we know the Indians came over. They left Asia with the yellow hue and murdered made with the blacks and they created a red hue. Study US history. Books are written on this stuff. 
I don't necessarily want to talk about that even before Columbus. But there's new documents. There's a document by David Imhotep, almost 400 pages, but a bibliography longer than anything I've ever seen dealing with this subject. He calls it the Africans, the first Americans by Africans. So we still talk about Pan Africans. You see, Pan Africans is how we unite all of this. How do we bring the Africans in the Caribbean? The Africans in the English speaking world, the Africans in the Spanish speaking world, the Africans in the Portuguese speaking world, the Africans on the continent of Africa, the Africans in, in North America. How do we bring them together around this economic, political, and cultural? That was always the vision of Pan Africans. Though they had to do it in increments. The first thing was to do what? Decolonize the continent. And in Puma, in Yeda, and in Zikwe, and others took the lead in that. And they were successful. In wrestling in Nigeria back, they were successful in getting Kenya, and Tanzania, and Ghana, and Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe then had to fight a harsh armed revolution. But they won. But there's still the next phase of Pan Africanism. How do we get to a Pan Africanism where the African American, the foundation of Black America, is not fighting against the most recent immigrants from Africa as though they don't belong to the same race or they're not a part of the same history or not a part of the same culture? That's because of ignorance of this lack of understanding of the concepts of Pan Africanism. Our obligation. If we are even beginning to talk about Pan Africanism, our obligation as an Ottoman put is to lead one from the darkness into the light. And the brother from Somalia, who was brought over here, you know, America have a refugee agency, y'all didn't know that. And they settle our people where they want them to settle. So what they, what they do now, they move the African population in places where they remain a minority. Western areas, New England areas. So we'll find we're there, but we're not, we have no power. And we're forced to do the cheapest labor for the cheapest price with no protection, no union, no insurance. But that's a little better than the conditions we left at home in the wars that was created by the West to steal our raw materials. But the one thing they don't want is what the big group is in was the National Security Advisor under Mr. Jimmy Carter, the president who is now making his transition. And I would like to comment because he seemingly was a very nice man. And he looked like he was trying to do some good things. But his National Security Advisor wrote a white paper. And the white paper that the big new Brzezinski wrote as the policy of the United States was that the African on the continent of Africa and the African Americans should never be allowed to unite economically, politically, and culturally. That is still the policy of the United States of America. And this is a matter of record. And you can find Brzezinski's paper. And you're going to counter that. You're going to have to become aggressive at understanding and implementing the ideal of pan Africanism that seeks to unite the African persons across the world, around those three areas, things economic, things political, and things cultural. If you want to see how well it works, there's a good book. It's called Tribe. Anybody ever read the book called Tribe? Yeah. Who the book called? Yeah. Well, Tribe is about how the Indian, East Indian community have an international cultural and economic network and Vikings system. How the Chinese have an international cultural network and banking system. How the Jewish community have an international cultural and banking system and trade system that includes, that includes their countries, their institutions, and their people. But the Africans don't, the wealthiest population in the world, don't have a banking system of their own. They don't have a cultural system that 
locks them in relationships with other Africans around the world. Don't have an international trade network that allows them to move their goods to other Africans around the world. And that is what the West is constantly making sure never happens. And that is the challenge of that. <coughs> Do you kind of understand what I'm saying? <coughs> yes. Because this is really not a game. This is about your babies. This is about your children and your grandchildren. Are they going to grow up in a community where we're going to find them a Monday morning that our kids have killed 30 and 40 for one another on Saturday and Sunday night? <coughs> and you can't do anything about it. And the police force should turn to you will be made for people who don't live in your community, notwithstanding those four murderers who killed that child out of numbers. They are not understanding them clearly. They were just white folks, black folks, or white folks, and black things. They were not operating from any African base. They were not operating from any African spiritual system. They were not operating from any African cultural space. They were operating from the space of the dominant, elite, ruthless of law enforcement in America, and that is white group of plan thinking white male Americans who have partnered with white female Americans to commit on the greatest genocide of the world on people. And Russia did to their its people what any one of our major police force do to black people in any given year, the whole world would be up in arms talking about how rotten Putin is and what Russia does or what China does. We do it every day to black Americans and it is known. Because we don't have any kind of African relationship so that the governments of Ghana, the government of Nigeria, the government of Zimbabwe say, you don't do that or we cut off trade with you. You don't touch my people or you will not get another boatload of raw material from my shores. Do you understand that we call the borders of the Congo right now, just the Congo, to the Western world. Jet planes will stop flying in about six to eight months because they don't have any coal. Do you know what we call the borders of Ghana? Half of the world goes to fly with no longer folks towards the West. And you can do that for almost any country in Africa with a natural resource. And it isn't just the West, India, the Arab world, Israel, they're all in God, they're all in Nigeria, they're all over Africa, <laughs> participating in the genocide of African people by restricting the industrial development of the continent of Africa, leaving us to be dependent on the industries of the West using the raw material of Africa. We don't have to go to the industries in the West. The only kind of Africanism can bring an end to this kind of arrangements. And we don't have to be draconian. You can say, like, if you want to make um, aluminum, you need bauxite, right? To make bauxite from raw bauxite to aluminum is a six stage process. We said, look, do three stages in Asia and do three stages in Africa. So we develop an industry that can employ our people just like you do. But that's not how imperialism and colonialism works. They don't care anything about your development. Yeah. We want hospitals too. We want roads too. We want bridges too. We need more universities also. But the West says that if we do that, then you become a competitor. And since you have most of the world's raw material, you will be the chief competitor. So you gotta make sure that we stay in control of your own material. And you become our primary consumers. And that's what pan Africanism was trying to address. They were trying to say, let's come together as Africans where we are in the world and solve the problem of economic politics and culture. By utilizing our relationship, by understanding that True freedom is to be shackled to your identity. And for the Africans in the room, let's see Africans, don't you feel bad sometimes sitting in a place that everybody knows who we are except you? 
All you have is a label of an African American. Now, if somebody says, what does that mean? At best, you may say, I'm black. And if you get a little consciousness, you say, I'm a black. But where are your holidays, your holy days? Other people stop home school system every year. They have holidays. You know what holidays are? They're really holy days, right? They're those days where historical events took place among your people that you use as markers that you want to constantly imitate and emulate, right? And so you celebrate them in these increments so it keeps you bound together. So we've got that King's Day, and most of us don't even celebrate. 39 years old, he took a bullet for you and died. He was beaten and thrown in jail probably hundreds of times. And people fought to get his day as a sacred day, and most black people don't celebrate it. Don't even think of it. You know what? Because you don't know what the holiday is supposed to do. Other ethnic groups celebrate. We see their holidays on every continent in the world. But you ask us that why? That group is more successful than any other group in the neighborhood. Maybe you've ever seen why they are that successful. Because identity and pan Africanism beg the question of identity because you can't even have a discussion of the pan unless the African is there. And the African is the identity of those who are about to be united around things economic, political, and cultural. And so today, the African American, I keep coming back, those the one of the wealthiest African population in the world. We spent about $1.8 trillion last year, $1.7 trillion, $1.6 trillion, we just keep passing out a trillion a year. At $1.8 trillion, we made more money than the Soviet Union. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We made more money than Saudi Arabia, but all that all. Right? Yeah. We made more money than Canada. Why the hell are we talking about being in poverty? We made more money than Canada. Why the hell are we talking about being in poverty? We are impoverished because we have not carried out the work of the pan Africanists to unite the elements of the African world so we can aggregate the wealth that we have and move it from riches to wealth and develop the kind of industry that would sustain our community. Right now, the dollar bill of the black community, when it comes in, it stays in about eight hours and it leaves. The dollar bill, when it comes into the Latino community, stays in about 10 hours. In the Jewish community, about 18 hours. In the Irish community, about 11 hours. That means they get the benefit of the dollar money from one of their business to the next business to the next business. Right? And they're able to use that wealth and build institutional frameworks where they live for the protection of themselves and their families. And so when we talk about pan Africanism, it's not just a phrase on history, it's not just a discussion about. Uh, Mr. Garvey and um, Mr. Nkrumah or Du Bois or Booker, but it is a discussion about how do we unify Africa and Africans for the survival of Africa and Africans. And if you study history well, you'll see that Frederick Douglass' son married for his Washington daughter. That means there's a relationship between Douglass and Booker, doesn't it? Marcus Garvey comes into the country because he's invited by home for a washington Right? Garvey stays when he gets here, I came to implement the Skippy model. Garvey's the number two person. Anybody know who was in the UNIA? There was an African American woman from Washington, D.C. named Henrietta Benton Davis, who was trained in a protege of Frederick Douglass. When Garvey goes to prison, Henrietta Benton Davis is the head of the UNIA. She's the one who's on board of the Black Star Line on its maiden voyage. When the Ku Klux Klan and the sheriff and the police down in Florida hijacked the ship and kept it in quarantine until they ran out of food and money and bankrupt them. Under the auspices that some blacks escaped of the chain gang and they were afraid they would get on the ship and the ship would take them out of town. But again, I'm reading all these little tidbits in history because if we were serious about pan-Africanism, we could solve those types of problems. Those types of